but, but also it, they have their own advantages. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to start formally by saying that I am very much pleased to welcome uh, Professor Cliff Andrews uh, to this session. We have known each other for a, quite a long time. I don't know how many years. Uh, I don't really know how many years, but I first, we first I personally first met him at Ege University uh, when he came to American Department as Fulbright Scholar. I was at I was at the English Department, but I do remember very well how he contributed uh, to both departments. He contributed tremendously to both departments and uh, the graduate programs. I do remember how our graduate students were very much pleased in your classes, Professor Andrews. And I am very happy that uh, Olga Noja thought of this session, invited you to uh, this session. And so I'd like to thank you once again, and Olga Anuja as well, before I leave the floor to her, to her introduction and uh, uh, starting the session. Mm -hmm. Thank you again, Cliff, very much for accepting the invitation. Thank you. It's my pleasure. You're very welcome, and it's great to see you again. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hojam. Thank you. Well, again, let me introduce Cliff Hojam. Uh, of course, he was one of the professors I took courses in my PhD uh, studies at Kadiras University some, some, some time ago. But I want to introduce him officially uh, a little bit. Of course, he has uh, he's been teaching, I guess, maybe four to five years now. He's, um, well, you. <laughs> Mostly well, in I, Turkey, my dear, my yeah. dear, mostly in Turkey. Is, yeah, thank you. So uh, he's retired uh, from Kadirat University from the Department of American Literature and Culture. He has taught at the University of Texas at Austin and in Turkey at Ege University, as uh, Hocam already mentioned, Bazit University, Bashkent University, and finally at Kadirat University. He is the author of Johannes Secundus, um, The Latin Love Elegy in the Renaissance and Austin City Limits. And with um, Selhan Hoca, Selhan uh, Andrus, he has translated Turkish poets Given Turan, Enis Potur, Gülten Akın, and novelist Selçuk Altun. His translations and articles have appeared in, among others, Agenda, Chicago Review, Edinburgh Review, Massachusetts Review, Near East Review, Quarterly West, Renaissance Quarterly, Seneca Review, Southwest Review, Texas Studies in Language and Literature, etc. These are some of them. So I'm not going to, of course, uh, rehearse, repeat all the achievements that he has done so far. Uh, but now I'd like to leave the floor to my dear Hojam, uh, Clifford Hojam. Uh, and I'm sure our students are all excited about um, uh, listening to him and benefit from his uh, immense knowledge on, let's say, l let me repeat the title, Modernism, Postmodernism and What's Next. And I'm sure um, uh, they will be all anxious to hear about uh, your speech now. And thank you once again for uh, being with us here, for accepting this invitation. And thank you, Hojam. OK. <clears throat> well, you're very welcome, Okahan. Oh, John, and thank you for that nice introduction. Um, and uh, so, <clears throat> yeah, it's a pleasure to be there. I don't, uh, am I going to see the faces of these students? I think their cameras are off, but I'm okay. here with you until the okay. end. <laughs> All right, no, it's, um, it's as they wish. So what this is, is, n is not a very well, um, not a tightly organized talk or lecture or class is just kind of a ramble, a ramble through the woods of recent literature. And uh, we were talking about, well, what what should this be? Modernism, postmodernism, and what next? Those, you know, those those uh, names are just sort of <coughs> categories or labels that are more or less, in my opinion, arbitrarily applied to the the field, the stream, actually the continuous stream of literature. 
and American literature to divide literature up into categories also like American, English, Turkish, et cetera, et cetera, is also a little bit arbitrary. Of course, it's necessary. We have to go through it. Uh, we have to do it. It's useful. But I have a few ideas here. And so I was just reflecting on sort of uh, what might be happening now and where might things go and what might they have to do with, um, with what happened previously. And not to go far, far back, I would just um, start like in the late uh, 19th century because here's what got me started about this. You know Paul Auster, who is, you know, a card-carrying postmodernist, right? Lives in New York, you know, writes for movies, writes this book, that book, the other book, and all kinds of styles and so on. He is a bona fide postmodernist. Well, what has he just done? He has just published a biography of Stephen Crane. Not only a biography, but 800 pages worth of biography. A big fat book, which I haven't seen it yet, but what does it tell us that a postmodernist like Auster is interested in um, an author like Stephen Crane, who published his Red Badge of Courage back in 1895, a hundred, what, 120, 125 years ago, something like that. So here we are. So I started going back and looking at that, and I also realized that this is uh, um, 2022. I almost said 1922, because I feel a little bit more at home in 1922, I think, than I do in 2022. But in any case, it is the 100th anniversary of the publication of two major works, that is T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland and um, James Joyce's Ulysses, right? Ulysses came out in February on February the 2nd, 1922, put in the window of Shakespeare and Company bookshop in Paris. And of course, it was banned in America. Let's not forget that. Mm. The Puritan Americans didn't like that. And they are still banning books, but, let, but let's not go into that at the moment. So these two texts became really foundational texts for modernism, one in prose, the other in poetry. So... <clears throat> but what do they relate to? Well, now let's go back to Stephen Crane. So <clears throat> Stephen Crane's book. Uh, how much time are we going to have, Olga Han, by the way? I don't want to go on and on forever. Uh, I think four to 30 minutes, 40 minutes, as you wish. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Just give me a warning. <laughs> no problem. No problem, Olga. Right. So, uh, yes, so Stephen Crane, Paul Auster and Stephen Crane. So in, in 1895, uh, Stephen Crane publishes this book, The Red Badge of Courage, which uh, he is 24. He was born in 1871, something like that, 18, early <clears throat> 1870s. And The Red Badge of Courage sells like crazy, sells like hotcakes. But what is it exactly? I don't know if, uh, if your, your students have read that or if it's on your list, but it is really about the Civil War. The red badge is the wound that you get uh, in wartime, you know, if you, if you get shot. Now, obviously, Stephen Crane did not participate in the Civil War. That was over in 1864 or five. So before he was born, nevertheless, uh, Crane's Red Badge of Courage is one of the most realistic accounts of the war that we have. So what is he doing exactly? He's fictionally, he's approaching through fiction, the reality of the, of the war, of the war between the states. Now, <clears throat> um, what does that mean? And what is, what is the context of that? Why is it important? Well, at the time it comes out in 1895, what do we have? We still have in England and also in America, the publishers are pushing these huge Victorian novels. 
you know, Dickens, Thackeray, all these people, the novels that go on for 700, 800 pages and are called triple decker, triple deckers because uh, the publishers like to have them in three volumes. So for for capitalist reasons and they go on and on and on and on. Uh, some of them are, are very good. We still read some of them, but most of them we don't. What's the difference with Crane? Crane learned how to write as a reporter, a newspaper reporter. So he began uh, filing news accounts uh, in his late teens, early 20s, and he brought that style into the novel and combined that with an extremely sympathetic imagination, placing himself into the shoes of the characters that, that he wrote about. So you end up with a tight, energetic, empathetic style, which is the very opposite of the fashion of the Victorian blockbuster. And that <clears throat> would have its effect. I, uh, let's think Hemingway, you know, getting on, but <clears throat> so, he goes on, he has, uh, he covers, he, he, he publishes more novels. He also publishes poetry, which we'll get to in a minute. And he covered wars uh, for all his life. Um, but <clears throat> nothing really was the landmark work of the Red Badge of Courage, except for his poetry which few people, not everybody knows Crane's poetry, and I'm not sure it's in the anthologies, but his collection of poetry, Black Riders, called the Black Riders, also came out in 1895. And uh, let me give you a taste of that. So let's think ahead to the wasteland and now think back to, to Stephen Crane. Here it is. Um, I saw a creature, naked, bestial, who, squatting upon the ground, held his heart in his hands and ate of it. I said, is it good, friend? It is bitter, bitter, he answered, but I like it because it is bitter and because it is my heart. Now, compare that to Tennyson, Hausman, um, you know, the other, who else? Who else was writing poetry in the late 19th century? Um, well, where did he get this? <clears throat> how, did, how, did, uh, how did this kind of tone, this kind of attitude, this kind of compression come to, to Stephen Crane? Well, the answer is Emily Dickinson. Okay, now, <laughs> of course, I don't think Emily Dickinson would have written, you know, a poem about a, a man eating his heart. But nevertheless, this is the, the new tone, the new attitude, the new style that is creeping into American literature. And from American literature, it goes outward. Now, <clears throat> if you jump ahead 27 years to the wasteland, in 1922, what is the tone of the wasteland? We all know that. Hmm. It's it's uh, ironic, bitter, hmm. down. It's you know, it's far from romantic hearts and flowers. And the wasteland, of course, comes out in uh, the 1920s after World War One, and after the disintegration and shattering of Europe by that war. Crane is writing before that. Crane is writing before that. So before the Great War, before all those upheavals of the of the of the nineteen tens. Well, I would suggest that this new tone is modernism. Is the roots is the roots of uh, uh, modernism and the pattern for modernist writers. Just think Hemingway. I mean, if you you can go from the Red Badge of Courage to Hemingway's, you know. Reports and Hemingway was also a reporter. 
So you find it in farewell to arms, which is, you know, uh, against war and all this uh, kind of thing. Now, so <clears throat> that is Crane as a sort of background writer of the 20th century. And now we're up to 1922 with Joyce and, um, and T.S. Eliot. Let's look at Joyce for a minute. Uh, is Joyce, let's take Ulysses. Is Ulysses in any way, shape, or form like the Red Badge of Courage? Well, no, not really. I don't know how many students have uh, read Ulysses or how many. Actually, it's been recently translated into Turkish, I understand. And um, I hear that it's good, and I hear that, tr that the translator worked, you know, it's like a life work for him. Uh, and I don't know the name. I don't remember the name. You may you may know Gonzale, but anyway, there it is in Turkish. And so God knows what it's like. But if it's anything like the original, well, it's important. So, <clears throat> in a way, Ulysses is doing a sort of I I don't want to say opposite exactly, but it's another stream of modernism. It's another stream of modernist consciousness. And what he's really trying to do is include everything, trying to overcome the kind of disconnectedness, the disconnections of the modern world. Uh, and, you know, this is poor <clears throat> Stephen Dedalus, who, who wanders through um, Dublin on, on June 16th, Bloomsday. <coughs> And what kinds of things does he take up? Well, the weirdness of the modern world, the situation of Europe after World War I, colonial, colonialist politics, capitalist, capitalist exploitation, uh, the situation of men and women, marriage and sex, what is that about? All those concepts who, which have been emptied of the meaning they had just a generation before in the 19th century. Uh, if you read Chesterton, you read all those uh, great, wonderful religious uh, people. I mean, not, not that they were particularly religious, but they still believed in orthodoxies. They believed in God. They believed in the power of whatever church they belonged to. And uh, they believed in the mission of the, in the civilizing mission of Europe the white man's bird, <clears throat> excuse me, the white man's burden and so on. And the, the uh, nobody had questioned the dominance of Europe throughout most of the 19th century. What, what, but now they are. So all of those concepts have sort of been, had their meaning questioned. Plus who has come in, Freud, and uh, psychologists have to come in to talk about consciousness, memory, dream, and what do those things have in relation to each other. So what's really going on? Uh, it's really impossible to distinguish one of these things from another. And Stephen Dedalus wanders through the world of Dublin, questioning all this and wondering who he is and what he's about and what's going on, as does Leopold Bloom, who is a kind of father figure for him. Now. I don't want to go on uh, very much about um, Ulysses. <clears throat> One could do, but you have your you have your Turkish text to <laughs> dip into. Oh, and uh, as uh, how many of you are interested in translation? You well, still just there. can I just interrupt for a moment? Good, Thank yeah. you very much for about actually reminding us 1922. We should. I mean, in my classes uh, next week, I shall remind the students this year, 1922, uh, from the English side as well, Virginia Woolf and Ian Forster, and even Picasso was painting his, as you know, uh, the modernist uh, paintings. Now, but as to Ulysses, in the translate, there are two translators, but the last one is, a, as you say, um, Crane's biography. It's like a big 
uh, red fat book, a translation made by Arman, but I'd like to, I don't know him, but I know the translator. I mean, that he is the translator. But you may remember from Ege, there was a young research assistant, Gülden. Do you remember Gülden, Gülden Ertuğrul? That yes. she helped him because because she she has uh, now she is now known as uh, Irish specialist. She oh. specializes in Irish theater, and she has translated a couple of books from Irish uh, uh, literature. And she helped Arman, I know, in re-editing the Ulysses, the last version of Ulysses, and she presented me this big fat book in your uh, in your verse it's a big fat book uh, the translation of ulysses i was looking at the book in in google you know saint google helps us uh, so i saw the, because the book is in cheshme in my summer house she yeah. she took it uh, there so thank you very much for reminding all this uh, uh, cliff thank you very much professor Andrus. no i love it. If, if my turkish were better i would love to do a bit of comparison of the Turkish translation with the English original. I would love to see how they dealt with those particular technical problems. If That's you what... met Gülden, if you met Gülden, Gülden knows very, she, she was a young assistant, but she's now excellent. I, I, I mean, she's very good. She has developed himself, herself. So if you talk to Gülden, she would, uh, well, I, I can arrange something maybe. Okay. We'll, we'll see, okay? Uh -huh. Okay. So we have so we have that stream of uh, literature and consciousness coming forward, and we move into the uh, 1930s, and then we get another war. Of course, you think when will they ever learn? <laughs> you know, when will they ever learn? And I don't want to even mention what's going on today, this very day, you know, in the, in the Ukraine. So. <clears throat> So the, the uh, postmodernist literature of uh, disillusionment comes in, of course. Um, uh, just to say briefly, in the 1930s, the the the, the reach of Stephen Crane uh, moves into <clears throat> the 30s, which is before the war, where people take up social causes, uh, and in, especially in America, the, the the there's the Great Depression, so the problem of Poverty arises, and uh, the question of how to deal with this, which brings up the issue of what people call socialism, which is very much hated by the capitalists, and so on and so on. But in literature, you get um, <clears throat> a couple of things. You get Steinbeck and the kind of uh, a realism that we saw back in the 1890s with the literary realists, and I would say, I would just mention this in passing because I want to move on to other things. There is James Agee, who is, uh, that's A-G-E-E, -E, who is writing, uh, <clears throat> hmm, oh, I, I better not get into this. There, there's a kind of, of a state project, the WPA project, which the government is funding um, art for a change, and it was a brief episode. They hardly do it anymore. And A.G. and a photographer, um, Walker Evans, go through the South and they take pictures. The photographer takes pictures and A.G. writes prose about those pictures. And this is a book called Let Us Now Praise Famous Men, which, uh, is a rather bitter title. Should we praise famous men for getting into the into getting us into this mess? That's really what it's about. And he goes on to write a, a poetry and uh, and and a novel that still um, is famous called A Death in the Family. But I don't want to, that's sort of a detour. I don't want to get off on that. But <clears throat> there is also. Then we come up to the uh, the war, the second uh, the second war, and the uh, and the outcome of that. People like Kurt Vonnegut. Now I mentioned Vonnegut, whom you know. I think you you read him in his class, his his books, Slaughterhouse Five, and so on. 
This is interesting, are regarded as science fiction. He won science fiction awards for those novels. Now, are those books really science fiction? Now, the word, the, the, the category science fiction doesn't come in and really until the 1950s. That's when it gets, it gets um, invented, sci-fi. Okay, now, now let's jump back again to 1895, which is the year that Stephen Crane publishes Red Badge of Courage. It's also the year that H.G. Wells publishes The Time Machine. Three years later, he publishes The War of the Worlds. Now, they don't have the term science fiction in those days, but that's, of course, what it is. What is, what is Wells doing? Um, he is also a socialist. He belongs to the Fabian Society, and he's running with, these, uh, with this crowd in England who are pushing socialism as best they can. Uh, in other words, um, they bring about the Labour Party which still exists. Okay, so what is going on in the, <clears throat> in the made up world of science fiction? How does it relate to what we might like to call the real world? That's what I really want to come to. And I want to say, that this business of uh, whatever it is that Wells is writing, and let's save the term science fiction till we get you know, to the middle of the 20th century, is, exists in a kind of parallel stream to what is coming forth from you know, the more realistic fiction of Stephen Crane and the more I don't want to say surrealistic fiction, but the, uh, and I hate to bring up the word modernism, modernist because that remains to be defined, but the work that we see in Ulysses and Virginia Woolf and, uh, and those people. So where does this uh, future, future, futurologist work of Wells belong? It's really outside the mainstream, isn't it? It's kind of a parallel stream, but it's dealing with some of the same some of the same issues. In fact, many of the same issues. So the <clears throat> it has its own influences. That's what I want to come to. The point is that H.G. Wells in 1895 really became the inventor of modern science fiction, which would be a parallel stream of literature. Uh, throughout the century, not giving wonderful recognition from the establishment, but it lists, but it lives, it survives, and uh, it, it comes and people use it when they need to. What is Vonnegut writing about? Slaughterhouse-Five, have, have, have your students um, encountered Slaughterhouse-Five? Yes, Ujam, yes, in second year, um, in under the course post-war American fiction, they actually read the ones who read it would know. The ones who didn't, I don't know. Well, this is about the bombing of Dresden in World War II by the Allies and the destruction of this ancient medieval city and all its beauties. 90% of Dresden was destroyed. Vonnegut was there. He was in the army. Uh, he was a prisoner of war. Prisoners of war were kept in a slaughterhouse, an old slaughterhouse, and he managed to survive the bombing by taking shelter in a basement three stories below the earth. Now, if that sounds close to the news coming out of the Ukraine, I can't help it. Uh, that's the case. Now, and if you read that, you'll see that it is a very graphic and dark picture but it won a science fiction award. Now, what does that mean? Is it science fiction or is it reporting? Is it realism? <laughs> you know, see what I mean? So now, uh, and this is, uh, this is not until the 1960s or so that, that Vonnegut publishes that book and 
and becomes well known and famous because of it. The the actual fact and reality of the bombing of Dresden was suppressed. You know, ordinary Americans, ordinary Brits never really heard of that um, until it until it was brought out by that. Anyway, the th <clears throat> I'm just using this as a kind of transition to the next. Um, question, which is, hey, what next? <laughs> you have modernism, postmodernism, and what next? Now, in, in passing, I would say that Wells had his followers and he had his influences. And one of those was um, a, <clears throat> I want to talk, I want to mention just three or four people, but one of those in the 1930s a book published in the nine, in in 1930 itself, as a matter of fact, by Olaf Stapledon, was called "Last and First Men." Now, um, it's a big fat book too. So you know, when when you students have leisure time and nothing to do, and the time time on your hands, and want some, I don't think it'll ever be translated into Turkish. <laughs> but it had it had its followers. It had its followers. Uh, Last and First Men is a future history of mankind. We are we are the first human beings. Men means, of course, uh, women also it means mankind. So the first species or variety of humans is us. And then he goes forward for two billion years, not two hundred years, not two thousand. You know, not 200,000, but 2 billion years. And he takes us through 18 different species of mankind. They come and they go. You know, they destroy themselves. Somebody else, you know, and another species grows up. It's evolutionary. But is it is it progressive evolution or is it regressive evolution? That's the question. Are we moving into utopia or dystopia? Well, a lot of people picked up on Stapleton's ideas there and thought, hey, you know, there might be something in this. Now, <clears throat> okay, so this is the history of humanity for two billion years, and it is coming out of the work that H.G. Wells pioneered in, in um, you know, as I say, the late 19th century. And by the way, uh, you know who Orson Welles was, right? <laughs> Orson Welles made a radio play of H.G. Uh, Wells. There were no relation. H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds and played it on the radio back in the days before television. And everybody in America, not everybody, but nearly everybody panicked because it has to do with the invasion of Earth by Martians. And the news report comes on your radio. Martians have invaded. This is what they're doing. And they're reading from the book. Well, nobody knows that it's from a book. So they, uh, you know, it was, a, it was an amazing, it was an amazing experience. That was before my time. Um, but I have to say that I was listening to the radio. It was early morning back on the morning of September the 11th, 2001, when the World Trade Towers in New York were bombed. And uh, I was just waking up. It was like nine in the morning, something like that. Um, and the news reports were coming in and I thought, oh, they're replaying War of the Worlds on public radio. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't. So <clears throat> I just bring this up because I think we, if we come to what's happening in the future, uh, you know, in, uh, in, in, with regard to what's next in literature, we should think about that. Now, <clears throat> okay, so two people I would mention here who we might, whom we might call futurologists and who might be giving us a clue as to what's going to happen next. One of those is a, a Polish 
fellow named Stanislaw, Stanislaw Lem. You know who he was? He died in 2006. And uh, he was 18 on September the 1st, 1939. Now, what happened on September the 1st, 1939? As you may know, Germany invaded Poland. And um, there's a there's a W.H. Uh, Auden, you know who he was, the English poet, was in New York at the time and uh, sitting in a bar and wrote a poem about that called September the 1st, 1939, which is in the anthologies. Uh, Lem is not in the anthologies because he hasn't been translated all that much. We, we know him best, we may know him best from his um, novel, which was made into a movie called Solaris. Did you ever see that movie? Okay. Well, that is Lem. So he was born in 1921, died in 2006. He was born into a Jewish family in Poland. Uh, so they were, of course, uh, suffered enormously and, you know, uh, unspeakably under the occupation of the Nazis and the Nazi Germans. Uh, he lost most of the family. Um, this was, I, th I think, I forget his city, whether it was Krakow or what, but, you know, the Jewish population of the city was uh, virtually destroyed. 90% of it or more was destroyed. Um, <clears throat> but, and then, of course, what happens when the, when the Germans go away in 1944? They get the Russians. <laughs> so they get, they get the USSR, the Soviet Union. And what about, <clears throat> now we come to the question of censorship. Uh, as we know from what is, <laughs> I, you know, I just, I didn't invent this, I, but what is happening today in Moscow to people who, who um, write accurate reports of the war on the Ukraine. You know, it's in the Turkish news. Yeah. There's a lot of things that the Turkish news doesn't report, but sometimes it reports fairly well on things happening outside the country. Well, you go to jail. If you disagree with the, with the official Kremlin line about what's happening in the Ukraine, you are uh, accused of perpetrating fake news and you were carted off to jail for 15 years and a big fine. Um, now, so to come back to Lim, and he wants to write about the situation in Poland, how is he gonna do that? How is he gonna write a true and accurate and faithful description of what's happening in Poland in the 1940s and not be shut down by the censors and either jailed or, or worse? Well by turning it into science fiction. So he projects, and what happens in his novels happen on another world and in the future, hundreds of years and on another world. And this is called dystopian science fiction, but someone who is familiar with the history of Poland at the time would call it realistic fiction. You see what I mean? So <clears throat> he is this, he is uh, people who have done a little bit of research into this and it, it's, it's not easy to do a lot, uh, have remarked on how similar certain scenes in his science fiction, how identical they are with historical accounts of what, was, of what went on in the cities of Poland in 1944, 45 and so on and so on. Now, okay, so what is he doing? So he's a futurologist, quote unquote, uh, and he is projecting into the future, uh, but he's also, in fact, writing history disguised as science fiction. Now, how does that fit into, does that fit into our two streams of, uh, of, of influence from you know, Crane and Joyce? Or is it a sort of outside, 
a par and outside the parallel stream of literature. Lim didn't like sci-fi. He didn't call. He didn't call. He didn't call it science fiction. He said, uh, "I hate science fiction." In fact, I forgive my French here, but I'm I'm quoting him directly. He says, "It comes from a whorehouse, but it wants to break into the palace where the most sublime thoughts of human history are stored." Well, that palace is, you know. Literature, the literary palace, the literary palace. So he writes history, um, the history of the world as if it were that of another planetary system other than this one. Now, um, <clears throat> OK, I don't want to. We don't have much of Lem accessible to us, so there's not much use in going on to it. I don't think he's translated into Turkish. He's only barely translated into English. Uh, but uh, but writers, certain writers are aware of him and are aware of what he's done. And I want to come finally to the last one uh, on my list that I, I, I want to mention. And this is an American fellow uh, named Robinson. OK. Um, what is his what is his full name? Mm. <laughs> anyway, it'll come to us. Robinson is 52 years old. Um, Lem died in 2006. All right. So what's that? 15 years ago. Robinson is 52. He is. Um, he is writing about climate change. I mean, to be brief. He is discussing what would happen, what will happen. He's a scientist. He is peace. He's a scientist and a literary man. He has a PhD in literature. He also has studied science and he 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 does research. He does vast amounts of research so that his science is accurate. And he postulates what are the likely effects of uh, and this is specifically America. What are the likely effects on American cities and so on if nothing is done, if we continue on you know, going the way we are? So there he's not the only he's not the only person who has sort of taken this up. It has a it's a subgenre of science fiction and it has a title. It's called fly fi. But <laughs> now, how far can Cli-Fi go? Um, Kim Stanley Robinson is his name, and one of his novels is called New York 2140, so 2140. By that time, New York is the Venice of the world, you know, canals, gondolas, so on. Where is the historical Venice? Underwater. Underwater. All right. Another one is called Science in the Capital. And another one is called the Ministry for the Future. Now, what these things do is they take up in many ways the same kinds of things that H.G. Wells took up, you know, over 100 years ago. That is politics, the politics and economics of the day. Where are they leading us? What about the capitalist financial system that we find ourselves embroiled in now? Is there any way out of it? Can we visualize a post capitalist financial system? Well, he's trying to do that. So the Ministry of the Future ends up in 2053 in New York. <clears throat> OK, and uh, these other ones go on, you know, for 100 years, 100 years, 200 years beyond that. Now, so how is. And again, we don't have time to to. Anyway, those novels are not translated into Turkish either, so you'll have to either um, work on your English or find a good translator to bring some of those into Turkish. 
but I would say two things are going on there. Number one, that these uh, these are being marketed as predictions about the future. But also at the same time, the landscapes, the cityscapes, the realities that he is portraying are also metaphor metaphors. They are metaphorical descriptions of our own time. And they also suggest to us they have a, a real life, a real world aspect in the same way that previous books, realistic novels, now I use the term, this is what they, they're called in your anthologies, Upton Sinclair, Upton Sinclair, whose book, The Jungle, I don't know if you've come across that one yet, is regarded as a super realist novel because, uh, and what, what Sinclair did was expose the exploitation of workers in the meat markets of the early, uh, of the 1920s and 30s. And actually that book was very much responsible for bringing about the existence of labor unions, which involved lots of fights between capitalists and workers and so on and so on. Now, <clears throat> and uh, then there was uh, in the 1950s, the beginning of the environmental or ecological movement came out of a novel called Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. Ever heard of that? So that had a huge effect. And what she did basically was what Robinson is doing in his works, which are called science fiction. She portrayed a world where insects, bugs, animals, and so on were gone because they had been wiped out by pesticides. Okay, so to come to, to, come to a close here, I would say that, and I, I wouldn't, I'm not saying this with any confidence, I put this forth as a, as a possibility, a projection, uh, a question whether this new kind of uh, fiction is going to become what's next. You know what I mean? So, <clears throat> in a way, it's activist fiction. I don't know if anybody is calling it activist fiction because it's really not, it's not getting out on the lines with signs and marching and protest because Robinson is very meticulous about his science. He consults with all kinds of scientists, and he and he also has is using Joyce. Uh, he is following in the footsteps of of the Joyce as a pioneer of modernism in his literary style. Just to give one example, chapters in certain novels are made up or spoken. The speaker or the narrator in a chapter varies from chapter to chapter. For example, in Adam. A molecule, a molecule can deliver a, a chapter. What is the molecule doing? What is the world of the molecule? <laughs> you know, what is, what is it doing? Who is it hooking up with? Where is it going? Why? And so on. So this, these kinds of ideas are, uh, you know, they may, they may have, uh, the idea might have originated with H.G. Wells, but it's been modified along the way by James Joyce and perhaps Kurt Vonnegut and people like that. So I see this kind of futurological so-called science fiction or cli-fi or whatever as a possible extension of the, you know, uh, streams of the of, of the 20th century mm -hmm. and add on a, a continuation, a development, a refinement of uh, um, realism, modernism, postmodernism, and the new what's next. Okay, so will it be relevant? Well, that's up to you guys. Very relevant, uh, <laughs> Cliff, thank you very much. You know, while listening to you, uh, I was speaking silently <laughs> with this uh, kind of stream of consciousness in my mind, oh. and you have attracted attention to uh, lots of issues. And thank you also for exemplifying 
uh, the works in um, modernist, postmodernist, and you didn't call it, but we were expecting you to call post humanist or uh, past humanist. I don't know, I have not heard of this yet, but past humanist. Uh, but these uh, terms like um, cli-fi, etc. And again, while listening to you, I thought of uh, automatically, especially the modernist part was excellent. Thank you very much. All of it, but modernist. I thought, for example, uh, maybe some have already thought of it and have written some works on it, articles, etc. But I thought of with the time machine of H.G. Wells, it automatically uh, brought to my mind Tanpanar's uh, probably people have thought of it. I didn't because I'm not dealing with novels, as you know. My area is still uh, Elizabethan period. But anyway, I thought of uh, Time Regulation Institute. Yes. Uh, probably it's been compared by many people. But the, 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 what was very uh, illuminating to me is their um, sci-fi um, aspect, which is not, I mean, um, uh, foregrounded. Um, maybe it is, but in my understanding. So thank you very much. And this sci-fi side, in order to, you know, to hide or to, uh, I mean, make yourself um, safe, uh, from uh, danger. Sci-fi is, uh, is a safe ground, in other words, but uh, makes us very uh, nervous, by, personally, again. Uh, I, just one uh, other thing. Thank you very much again for all these examples, because examples are much better than theory. Sometimes we talk about these issues in theoretical um, background, but the examples were very good. I thought of Polish, uh, I, I don't know a limb that you, I, I really don't know, thank you very much, uh, Solaris, but I know it, but I didn't know, limb, did you say, am I right? Yeah, me neither, I just I, can't I really didn't know this, mm -hmm. uh, it uh, was very good, but I thought of another Polish, not a writer, but a critique uh, uh, of Shakespeare, uh, Jan Kot, who was also writing during the same period. Are you aware of Jan Kot? Yes. Shakespeare, our contemporary. Look, he was also involved in, uh, I mean, um, reactionary uh, uh, movement against the, the Germans, and maybe later, I don't know, the Soviets, because he ended up in the US. I know that he uh, went to US. But in his um, Shakespeare, our contemporary, the book, Shakespeare, our contemporary, he, from another uh, political window, probably, he interprets uh, Shakespeare's works mm -hmm. in the light of his own experience, what he was suffering from, I mean, you know, Second World War and all those. Uh, so I thought of it, but I don't think that they have the same, they are in the same camp, probably different. Am I right, if you are aware of uh, Jan Kot? Yeah. No, I, I, I think there's a crucial difference there, but... Uh, exactly, this is what I mean, yeah. It's useful to read Jan Kot, I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh, uh -huh. yeah. How he made you, makes use of Shakespeare. But yeah. no, I think I think these people, and I'm, I'm not, I can't pass myself off as an expert or very uh, learned at all in this. Um, but I would say, you know, science fiction has been sort of ignored by the literary establishment all these years for you know for a century or more it's been kind of the black sheep of the family the sort of cousin mm -hmm. don't talk about too much mm -hmm. but now it may be time for it to you know to come into the fold and tell us some things about the world and our reality in literary terms that we need to know yeah. i don't know yeah. i was doing sort of random reading and and uh, this is this is what I discovered. Cliff, this was very suggestive as well. It is recorded that I'm going to, uh, some of the PhD uh, candidates are here uh, yeah. listening to you, I see them, but I'm going to uh, ask them to listen to this if they're not here, 
some of them. Maybe they have other classes and so on. I will ask them to uh, look at this, to listen to this uh, recording and uh, also th talk about it afterwards. We will do that. Thank you yeah, very much indeed. Great. Thank yeah, you. They're, the one, they're the ones to take this up and to and to come to a conclusion. Or... <laughs> well, we, I would be very happy if you sometime joined us also in the in the if it's possible, of course, if it is possible. Okay. Thank you. It was very good. I am, you know, I this is why I said I talk to myself silent talks while listening, because I remember the old days and talking to you, maybe I mean, at again, corridors at again, offices, again, university offices. Yeah, really Thank good. you. indeed. Thank you. Okay, so I'm I'm done. No, no. <laughs> okay, Hojam, thank you once more. Um, as I always say, whenever I talk to you, I learn something new, and you're always very informative. You've been always like that. So listening to you once more here on this platform uh, was quite nostalgic on my part. But thank you, I learned um, still many things today. I am just wondering if um, there are any students who. Who wish uh, who wishes to ask a question to you regarding your speech regarding the people that you have mentioned personally i save my questions to you at a later time when i see you in balat and having our coffee and eating our lunch uh, in the coming weeks right. uh, <laughs> but uh, are there any students anyone who would like to ask a question or command uh, or anything yeah. OK, I'm waiting for the students to raise hands if uh, if they have anything else to say, to ask, to comment. <laughs> well, I know that Sarah is very much interested in these issues. Sarah, would you be interested to uh, to just comment or ask a question? Well, Hujam, I came at the end. I got the link very late, so I don't know what had been discussed at the beginning. It's just like currently my field is of interest is to link transhumanism into ancient studies like mythologies and to show how it actually had been existed, but the term itself has been coined recently. But it is something that the world has already experienced, like with the fountain of youth, with the wings of Icarus, all those science fiction elements that existed in mythologies do actually exist now in real life. Besides science fiction, just telling history in a different point of view by making it more interesting, maybe for the younger people. But it also has been a field of research for scientists to bring mm. what they have read into their real life. And that would be it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, th <clears throat> yeah, thanks very much. No, that's that's an excellent point. So what's happening is that the tradition, the tradition is being. It's nourishing people are the tradition is being being brought forward and kept alive into you know the new, the new, the new times, and it and it supplies the lifeblood of this new stream, which I don't know much about, and I I would like to hear that from, you know, your generation. I would point out that when when Joyce is looking for a way to organize or unify his Ulysses and Stephen and Bloom are wandering all over the place, how does he bring it together? How does he unify it? Well, he bases it on Homer. Mm -hmm. He takes his structure from Homer, from the Odyssey. So, mm -hmm. in that same way, would would you say that the you know the transhumanists are using the the existing <laughs> the extant literary tradition? Well, if I may comment, actually, the transhumanists consider themselves as the modern Prometheus to be the torch uh -huh. bearers and the light bearers for nowadays civilization and society. Mm -hmm. Basically, I have a published book chapter in a transhumanistic book, and what I have argued there is that um, the transhumanists, even though they mean good, but there is also the other side of the coin or the dark side of the moon that once <laughs> reaching too high, they might also melt their wings and sink into the water. So everything needs to be deal dealt with with precaution. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Yes. Yeah. Well, thanks for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Carry Sarah. On. Carry on. I think there is one more. I can see Uslam is raising her hand. Uslam, yes, uh, please. Uh, it's really a pleasure, pleasure to meet you and to listen to you. Uh, I just wonder uh, that uh, can we assume science fiction as a part of quantum fiction uh, genre uh, as um, Wilson Harris uh, um, writes about it and finally he says I understood that I have been writing uh, um, in quantum fiction that finally I have realized uh, because it is just uh, a part of um, dimension between reality and the possibilities of quantum physics. <laughs> I don't know. I'm glad to hear it. So it's called quantum fiction? Quantum fiction literature and uh, it was coined by uh, Wanda Bonta after her novel Flight, a quantum fiction novel in 1996. Uh, uh -huh. And uh, it is really popular in the 21st century. Century, uh, and um, uh, it it really uh, makes it possible. For example, in science fiction, you just have to write about science uh, field, but in quantum fiction, you can write about everything, about mm. uh, the material world and also uh, the reality of life. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to learn about it, no. What I want to ask, is this person, now. I'm sorry, is this person scientist? A scientist? No, no, he, no, no. He, uh, Wanda Bonta is a writer and no. an artist also. Don't you need to be a scientist to be able to write about this? I just, please, please <laughs> forgive my ignorance. Oh, I'm a dinosaur and I cannot understand. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you're not a scientist, how can you just uh, write about uh, scientific? If it's fiction, okay, of no, course. No, no, no. Uh, it is, it's not about science. It is about quantum fiction. I say, um, can we assume that science fiction is just a part of uh, an element of quantum fiction literature? Mm. Well, what what you're doing again is is you know, is, uh, is something abstract, is looking for categories and labels and things like that. So, um, you know, you, you, can, you can define it for yourself. <laughs> Certainly you can do it if you want to. <laughs> I'm curious though, does quantum fiction have anything to do with quantum physics? Yes, very, quantum mechanics and quantum fi uh, fiction. Ah, um, I see. It, it's based on the possibilities uh, that are mentioned in quantum physics and mechanics, quantum mechanics. Right. Well, as I recall, the thing about quantum physics is that uh, the principle is that things change as you observe it. So of we course. never, so, we, yeah. So we so, never really do get a true actual, actual picture of the other. The more we look at it, you know, the more, you know, it becomes us in a way, right? Is that right? Of course, of course, of course. And they say, what, um, which one is the first, the particle or the observer? Ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. Thank right. you. Thank you. Yes. Send me a reference to this novel. I'll be happy to have a look at it. And then we can talk about what kind of fiction is this. <laughs> maybe it's not fiction, maybe it's real. <laughs> but as we know, as literature people, we know that fiction is real already. <laughs> yeah, thank well, you. Very well said, Ojam, very well, <laughs> as usual. Thank you, Islam, thank you very much, thank you. And um, so, any other people? No, yes? Hojam, do you want to say something? You say Hojam? No, no, no. Thank you very much. I've, okay. Uh, uh, then shall we, um, if there are no comments, questions, shall we just uh, say goodbye, say farewell until uh, the next time? Yes. Yeah. Until the next time. Well, thank you all. It was a pleasure. I very much enjoyed meeting you and, you know. And as I talk. said, as I said, I'll give this, uh, I mean, I'll ask the PhD and MA uh, candidates to uh, listen to this recording and then we'll talk about it. And okay. I'll be here repeating from the beginning, Sarah. I know okay. that you missed the beginning so that they can all 
watch it from the, I mean, listen to it and watch it from so the beginning. I'll so I'll stop recording, Hojam, now. Okay. Uh, okay. I'll stop recording.